Thank you very much for the kind invitation. So as a radiologist, my role in your care is to figure out why you hurt. So when I tell people um, about HSS, I say we're a specialty, about 200 bed hospitals, so a small hospital, but we're citing our 14th MR unit. They say 14, how can that possibly be? Because imaging really drives a lot of the management at HSS. And not surprisingly, it helps to drive some of our research program as well. So I run a very eclectic lab, all housed in the basement. I never see the sunshine of day there go. I never get any sun, sunscreen on. But here you can see uh, we have a group of researchers here. Matt Kopp is here tonight. He's a bioengineer, two bioengineers, a veterinarian, and research assistant. So an eclectic group that really drives our research program. These are our current active research funding, of, some of which are from uh, NIAMS and NIH, but also from Gen General Electric Healthcare. Obviously, all our magnets are GE, so we do work with the physicists at GE, Arthritis Foundation, and the American Orthopedic Society for Sports Medicine. So when we think about osteoarthritis, I hesitate to say that regardless of how old you are in this room, probably everybody has osteoarthritis, whether you're symptomatic or not. And traditionally, we use things like x-rays, and that's just an AP stand of the x-ray. The problem is x-rays show you bone, and they don't show you cartilage. Cartilage is soft tissue. So to see it directly, we have to use MRI, and MRI provides us with a direct visualization of the gray articular cartilage. We have shown previously, some time ago, almost 20 years ago, early in my career, that MR could predict what our surgical colleagues would see at surgery and would do so with a great degree of reproducibility. So you could pick up an MR and you could make a diagnosis very reliably. Well, let's compare that to how well our surgical colleagues do. In a recent study, and this, what's called a CAP is, is how a perfect measure of reproducibility would be a 1.0. So we were pretty close, and this is where our surgical colleagues are. Sorry, Todd, just kind of lagging behind imaging there just a little bit. So this is just what they see at arthroscopy, which is the tip of the iceberg. So we can use imaging metrics to actually model cartilage. So we can create these kind of cool images. And this is a piece of the femur or the, the thigh bone cartilage has been color coded according to thickness. Now, why is this important? Well, for some of my colleagues and co-investigators, very important, such as Suzanne Marr, who actually needs to do tissue engineer things like cartilage and meniscus, and she relies on Matt and myself to develop templates for her studies to give her these digital models. So how is this translational? Maybe good for an NIH grant, but how is it translational? Well, we take this four-year-old boy who had a bad accident, and the growth plate or the cartilage in his distal thigh bone has been interrupted. So what we've done in our lab is we've created a 3D model, and this is what the growth plate looks like. The blue is the area that's closed, that's abnormal, and we have validated it. So that means that a pediatric orthopedic surgeon can pick up this model and know very reliably exactly what percentage of that growth plate is closed. This is important for things like limb length discrepancy to know exactly how much a child is going to have a problem with and how the kind of surgical intervention they have to do. This is another example. This is a child that was treated with an elbow fracture in New Jersey. And so he came to us, and this was the maximum amount of flexion he could do. So he couldn't bring his fingers up to his mouth to feed himself. He had really, really stiff elbow. Well, Dr. Hotchkiss needed to take a plug from his knee and put it into his elbow to create a gliding surface. So researchers in my lab with Dr. Koff, we created these what are called curvature maps. So we did, looked at the cartilage thickness, and we found the perfect area of harvest from this boy's knee joint to put into his elbow joint to increase his range of motion. So at the end of the day, a lot of my day is spent telling the surgeons, these are your plugs cut here. And we do this with cartilage modeling. So the nice end of the day, this was his preoperative flexion, and this is his postoperative flexion. And now, of course, his hand is coming nicely up to, up to his face. So we know that cartilage can sometimes be a problem with injury. So some of you may be skiers. If you ski, you're at risk for ACL disruption. 
Cartilage resists compression, but not shear. And Peter Trozilli told me, taught me that about 20 years ago. And I would submit, we see the traumatic chondral injury every time you tear your ACL, which is a very common injury. We see compression over the condyle. And this is a, a lateral view or side view of the knee in the setting of an ACL tear in a shear. And you can see that gray bit is a free fragment in the meniscal synovial recess. So we looked at ACL disruption over time, and we try to figure out when does the cartilage start to go bad. Using MR as a non-invasive means, we found that at five to seven years, that's when the scores start to nosedive, and this means that the osteoarthritis is developing about five to seven years after ACL disruption. What was fascinating is the literature up to this time only said that about half of the patients that had an ACL injury sustained a cartilage damage. Based on our data, it was 100%. 100% of people that tear their ACL sustain a cartilage injury that we can see non-invasively at MR. And is this just, just uh, esoteric research question? Not really. These are what are called subjective outcome instruments. These tell us about pain and function. So for every change in the MR metric, there was an associated increase in pain score and decrease in function, indicating that these imaging non-invasive metrics reflect how patients perform and how they do in their athletic activities. But we need to go further. So we can look at cartilage, I can model it, I can create these kind of fun maps, but what we do now is we do something called quantitative MR. These color maps are you can think of as a non-invasive microscope. So this is one of my research fellows who had absolutely no athletic aptitude and therefore perfect cartilage. So if you look at this, this is what cartilage soot looked like. So it's, you go from orange down to the, the and this reflects, really these are so, uh, uh, MR reproducible parameters. This is one of my field engineers who's always on his knees fixing one of the magnets. So if we just take this lateral facet, you see how the cartilage thickness is normal, but there's, we've lost all that orange, it's all that green, that indicates there's depletion of matrix. Matrix are the building blocks of cartilage that give us the cartilage the ability to withstand load. Well, the really cool thing is that I can do all this by having you lie in one of my magnets for about 30 minutes or so. And we do this non-invasively, no needles, no dye, no ionizing radiation. So this is why they're clinically helpful. The only, this is a 15-year-old girl who's had a portion of her meniscus taken out. The only procedure that is FDA approved in the United States is meniscal transplantation. That's taking a cadaveric meniscus and putting it in the knee joint. When the, our sports medicine colleagues sit and talk to mom and dad, these are the data they're gonna say about disease transmission. So there's a risk. Albeit small, there's still a risk. Well, we know that meniscal transplantation will fail if the arthritis is already too far gone. So to that end, we use quantitative MR we see that her, what I call grayscale images look pretty good, but look at all this green. So I can say very objectively, because these are numbers with standard of deviation, that this 15-year-old girl already has osteoarthritis. We can look at cartilage repair. This is a cartilage repair technique. Now the surgeons are gonna see this. They're gonna see hypertrophic fill and they're gonna think that looks great. Very good fill with a cartilage repair procedure. But now I do my maps this is what normal cartilage looks like, and this is the repair area, clearly different. So why is this helpful? This obviates the need for a second look arthroscopy, a second procedure, and a surgical violation or biopsy of that repair tissue that we tried so hard to generate. We can go further beyond cartilage. We ask the question, just how stretched is your ACL reconstruction? What Matt and I are working on, we know this is a low signal or black graft. This is a gray graft. Now we can do quantitative mapping of the graft itself and eventually hope to tell you exactly how much strain exists in that graft and again, all non-invasively. Well, at the end of the day, we find that we can't cure osteoarthritis. So some of us will go on to joint replacement. And we know that the increase of joint replacements will be substantially uh, increasing in the, in the next few years or so. And the demand on the implants is gonna be higher because people are active when they have joint replacements. So this is a 59-year-old man. He has pain after his hip replacement on the right. This is a standard x-ray. Everything looks pretty good here, but this is what the MR looks like. So 
It's hard to kind of get a sense of it, but the arrows take you around what's called an adverse local tissue reaction. So those of you that white ride the, the subways or see on the side of the bus, do you have a metal on metal implant? Call 1-800-LAWYER. This is the adverse local tissue reaction that exists around implants. So this is the quote I get from my surgical colleagues, severe adverse tissue reaction, Hollis, this is the kind of implant that was supposed to last 20 years. So how can we detect this and how can we detect this early before tissue damage occurs? So the problem is I'm taking implants and I'm putting them, they're metallic, and I'm putting them in a big strong magnet. So the one thing we had to make sure is we weren't gonna suck the implants out and we weren't gonna harm the patient. We got around that, but then we had to come up with what's called a pulse sequence or a means using the MR to diminish the artifact. So if you look at this image, it kind of looks like a Rorschach. It's hard to get a sense of it. It's a frontal view of the hip. But now with a newer pulse sequence called, called Maverick that we helped to develop in collaboration with GE Healthcare, now you can see the neck of the implant. You can see the soft tissues around it. And I can be rest assured that this patient doesn't have an adverse local tissue reaction. So we find, using these MR metrics, that our MR techniques predict tissue damage at the time of revision. So we can catch these reactions much earlier than we could using standardized techniques with sensitivities and specificities much higher than anything else, including serum ion levels. So it's a multidisciplinary approach. I start with a clinical question, and then I find an imaging solution to solve it. And these kind of imaging metrics, again, are directly translational to our patients at HSS with a true bench to bedside approach. I'd like to thank you so much for your kind attention and knowledge, all the wonderful scientists and brilliant people in my lab. Thank you.